Good morning. Good to be with you. Thank you so much, Clay, for reading uh, the Gospel Narrative, Luke's account of the Advent story. It's good to be with you. Um, happy first Sunday of Advent. And uh, if, if you're anything like me, Advent is a familiar season, right? It's this season of anticipation, the season of expectation of Christ coming. And when I think about Advent, um, I realize that there's a certain familiarity to it, right? If you have grown up at, in the church, and so you're lighting the candles and you're counting down to Christmas, maybe you're doing that through a chocolate Advent countdown calendar, uh, like we got for the boys at World Market, but it's a season of familiarity as we expect and anticipate Christ's birth. But with familiarity also can come a sense of complacency, a sense of, I've been down this road before, getting a little bit lax or, or, or losing some of the sense of the wonder of what God has done. See, familiarity is really helpful when you're, when you're going down a difficult road. Uh, I keep scooting, so Don and Judy are scooting me over. I'll try to stay in one place here. Um, familiarity is good when you're going down a difficult road because you know the trail. You've been there before. But when it comes to something that can become just a routine, it can reduce our sense of wonder, our sense of awe of what God has done through the incarnation and sending Jesus Christ. See, isn't it amazing? Isn't it totally crazy that the Lord would choose a a virgin girl who's probably around 13 years old, and she'd become pregnant by the Holy Spirit and give birth to the Messiah? Who, who would have ever thought of that? Or isn't it wild that God would show up to shepherds in the passage that Clay read to us, and they'd have this whole angel choir, and the night sky would be lit up probably greater than any fireworks show that you had ever seen before? Or that there'd be three, three or, or more wise men, magi, who would come, and they would go before King Herod, and, and then they'd be warned in a dream not to, not to tell Herod where this baby was. See, the Advent story is filled with so many things that are, are so wonderful that would lead us to awe and wonder and greater worship if we slowed down and, and listened to the Lord and allowed him to fill us with that wonder again. When we think of wonder, it's, it's something that I think many of us are familiar with culturally. When I say the wonder of, of Advent or the wonder of the Christmas season or, or the most wonderful time of year, I wonder what comes to mind for you. I think often when we used to be able to go to Pacific Place and they had the indoor snow that you could go and look at as you shopped and snow indoors is a pretty cool thing. Or think about the wonder of driving. Terry and I would drive through Normandy Park and see all the lights. And there was this one home, I'm, I'm not sure if it's there uh, this year, but they would put up about 30 different breeds of inflatable dogs on their front lawn. I, I don't even know where you buy these things, right? And we'd drive by and our jaws would just drop with wonder at how much they love dogs and how much they love Christmas lights, right? So there's... Or, or think of Macy's and the, and the endless commercials around believe in the wonder of giving, right? There's, there was one that aired a few years ago of, of a girl and her mom. She's an, the mom was an astronaut. And, and the girl goes outside here on, on planet Earth and it starts snowing. And she's talking with her mom. And the mom opens up this gift that the girl has picked out for her and sent with her on her journey. And it's a snow globe. And so as the girl is seeing snow fall in her neighborhood, the mom is shaking this globe that the little girl got her and seeing snow fall inside of her spaceship. And Lacey says, believe in the wonder of giving. But wonder biblically is actually is something a little bit different, right? And that's what I want to look at this morning of how, how our wonder um, in awe of what the Lord has done in coming through Jesus Christ can lead us into a greater sense of worship, can lead us into greater witness. Because as the Claflins read for us this morning, the first candle is the, is the Advent candle of hope. And our world desperately needs that. I've been in conversations with folks just in everyday, my everyday life. They said, hey, is there any hope left? 
Is there any hope left in this world? And you don't have to not know Jesus to wonder that sometimes, right? Just when life feels hard and challenging. So, so we pick up with this word wonder in Luke chapter 2, verse 18. And I think in, in Clay's translation, it was um, marveled at or amazed. Um, verse 18, and all who heard the shepherd's words, they were amazed or they wondered at or they marveled at with the, with the posture of beginning to speculate, right? Dave preached a sermon series recently on who is this man, better understanding who Jesus is. But the crowds begin to wonder at what the shepherds said to them. And it's a, it's a term, actually, that appears at least 43 other times in the New Testament, usually in reference to people's amazement at Jesus after he does miracles. But there is a time when it refers to Jesus' own amazement and wonder. Do you guys know where that is? The faith of the centurion. Yes, the faith of the centurion. That's exactly where it is, that Jesus is full of wonder at, at faith in un, from an unlikely person, right? And so the shepherds God uses to breed wonder in those who don't know him when they hear what God has done and told the shepherds and when they see the baby Jesus. So let's, let's back up just a little bit and unpack what's going on um, in this familiar story of the shepherds' encounter uh, with the angels and then look at how God, what we might learn from them, how the Lord might use us to breed wonder um, and lead it into greater worship in our own lives. Are you guys with me? Okay. So we start out here in Luke chapter 2, verse 8, and it says, There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Now, we don't quite pick this up in our English translation, but it's really in the Greek, it can be like watching watch. It sounds funny, that's probably why it's not translated that way. Watching watch over their flocks by night. Now, the reason why that's kind of interesting and significant is because the shepherds are enough journey away from, from Jesus that, that they can get there with some quickness, right? And so, but exactly where are they? And, and while we don't know with 100% certainty, tradition has it that they are right around a place called Midgal Ed, Eder, M-I-D-G-A-L-E-D-E-R. And um, there was a place, and I'm, I'm reading a commentator here, that this is a play upon the words of watching watches because there was near Bethlehem, on the road to Jerusalem, a tower known as Migdal Eder, or the watchtower of the flock. So when they're watching watches, their watchtower of the flock. Here was the station where shepherds watched the flocks destined for sacrifice in the temple. Animals straying from Jerusalem on any side, as far as Jerusalem to Migdal Edgar, were offered in sacrifice. It was a settled conviction among the Jews that the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem, and equally that he was to be revealed from Midgal Eder. The significance of the revelation of the infant Christ to shepherds watching the flocks destined for sacrifice needs no comment, as the commentator says. So, so here they were on post, um, and, and uh, the Jews interpret one of the prophecies, I believe from Micah, to understand that this is the place where the, where, where the angel appears to the shepherds. But they're nearby Jerusalem. They're keeping watch over their flocks by night. They're, they're probably a group of smelly, dirty men. They, they weren't following Jewish law because they're a nomadic group of people. They're not coming regularly to offer sacrifices, right? And all of a sudden, they're just in an ordinary night and an ordinary group of people, and an angel of the Lord appears. And they do what almost everybody does in the Bible when an angel appears freak out, right? When you see an angel appear in the Bible, what is often the words that follow? Don't be afraid, right? There's a reason why. Like, it's not like, hey, what's up, dude? It's like, don't be afraid, you know, because the shepherds are probably wondering, are we in deep trouble right now, right? Is, is, is this an angel of death or what's going on here? And so an angel appears and says, don't be afraid, Pick up in verse 8 and 9. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. 
So I almost imagine that the shepherds at this point like are on the ground, like, Lord, just please, please don't hurt me, right? Spare me. What, what kind of greeting could this be? And Mary, when the angel Gabriel comes to her, she's deeply troubled, right? And she says, what kind of greeting could this be? The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they're terrified. So imagine being circled in, in, in almost unapproachable light. When Moses uh, was before the Lord, he, he could only see a little bit because uh, he couldn't look at the Lord and live. Now, the, Lord is a, the Lord's glory is here, and it's hearkening. Um, the words suggest the thought, uh, as the commentator says, of the Shekinah or the cloud of intoler- intolerable brightness, which was the token of the divine presence in the tabernacle and the temple. And the presence of the Shekinah was reckoned as one of the most precious blessings of Israel. So here, the shepherds are being brought into the story of what God has been doing throughout creation. And they are getting a sign and a symbol that, that God's blessing is upon them. And you have to remember, Pastor Terry preached on this last Advent season, all the prophecies that led up to Christ's birth. And then he talked about the silent period, right? About 400 years where it it felt like the world went dark, that there was no prophecy uttered, and and the people were in this season of great waiting. And so I imagine after waiting a long time, you finally kind of give up hope that God is really going to keep his promises. So you're not really looking. So when an angel shows up, man, and the glory of the Lord shines around you, how could that not leave you in awe and wonder, right? This is like the most incredible thing that they've ever experienced. So the angel says, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Basically, you know, we talk about evangelizing, sharing the gospel. That's what the angels are doing here. I evangelize unto you the good news. I evangelize unto you the gospel that will be for all the people. That's really, really good news. From the very beginning in, in, of the Bible, God makes clear that he is blessing Israel, that they would be a blessing to others. Their blessing was never meant to be held on to like a Christmas gift that you keep in store and put away in the closet. God said, I've blessed you that you will be a blessing to others. And here, God is saying through the angel, this is good news for everybody. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. He is the Messiah. He is the Anointed One. And this will be a sign. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Babies love to be swaddled. So we have to believe this was not very long after Jesus, Jesus was born, right? Lying in a manger. And if that wasn't enough, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a great company of heavenly hosts, meaning like a multitude of angels shows up. And you get all these reinforcements to that one angel. And now they are glorifying and praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and an earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. They are glorifying God, the same thing that at the end of the story, the shepherds do after they return. The shepherds see modeled glorifying and praising God, and they in turn do that when they come back to their watching watches. So the angels leave, and at this moment, the shepherds have have a choice, right? They have a choice to keep finishing out their duty. I don't know if they brought all their sheep with them, or to go at once. And the Bible says, they, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem. Okay, that is very watered down, right? It's like, let us go indeed. There's, I think it's called a participle. This is like a word form. It, it, it adds this emphasis, let us go indeed to Bethlehem. Like there's excitement here. It's not like, yeah, you know, maybe we can go. It might have just been a weird dream that we had. They make a distinctive choice to be interrupted in, in, in the midst of doing the job that they were doing and running after Jesus. 
Isn't that fun? A group of shepherds running after the shepherd from the very beginning. So they, so they say, let's go to Bethlehem, see the things happen which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off. Again, this emphasis on they're, they're making haste, right? And they find Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Now when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. So that's kind of interesting, right? They spread the word that what God announced to them through the angels was true. Not just that they saw Jesus, but they spread the word that there was congruency, that God keeps his promises, that what they were told out in their uh, shepherd field was indeed what actually happened. And all who heard it were amazed. They wondered at what had been told them about, his, about this child. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Uh, Michelle Anthony, in her book, Spiritual Parenting, talks about how you can't give away what you don't have. It's hard, it's hard she says, to parent teaching your kids about Christ if you're not loving Christ yourself or teaching them about service. The shepherds here give away what they have. They have a sense of wonder and awe of what God has done. And God uses them to breed that wonder in others. But the wonder for the crowds is a fleeting, transient emotion, as a commentator put it. It's just, it's here today and gone tomorrow. It doesn't lead towards worship. It doesn't lead towards life change. It doesn't lead towards anything else. It's a past tense word, happened, done, and it's not ongoing. But the shepherds have a different posture, and so does Mary, right? Mary does her own kind of pondering internally, her own kind of wondering at what God has done. But the shepherds go back and glorify and praise God, and the shepherds become some of the first evangelists of what God has done in in sending Jesus. So the Lord uses the shepherds to breed wonder in a group that that doesn't probably doesn't know him. So what? So this morning I believe that the Lord wants to use us to breed wonder and hope in those who don't they haven't heard the goodness of God. They aren't amazed by God. Baby Jesus stays in a manger as a baby and never grows up and becomes their king, right? But before the Lord does that in us and uses us in that way to be a witness, I believe he wants this morning to fill us first with wonder again. Wonder again at what he's done in coming. That this Advent season wouldn't just be another Advent season where you would show up on your couch or here, light another candle, sing some wonderful songs, and then move on with the things that really matter. So I want to look with the remainder of at our time at, at what happened in the shepherd's life. What can we learn from their story, from their experience of how God might want to use, use and fill us with that wonder again? So first, the shepherds, they look at a baby. Okay, Okay, I know I'm in a baby phase right now with Katerina. They look at baby Jesus, but there's something significant here. There's a reason why Jesus said, unless you become like a little one, you can't enter my kingdom of heaven. You can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus was really confused. He's like, how does an adult go back inside the womb? It doesn't happen, Nicodemus. That's not how it works, right? You have to be born again spiritually, You have to have the Lord fill you with his spirit and give you eyes that are new. Eyes that look with freshness at everything in life again. Lord, how would you have me see my decisions? How would you have me see my relationships? How would you have me see my finances? I've been doing it a certain way, or maybe I've been doing it sort of with Jesus for some time. But the Lord says you've got to have eyes again to see things like a child, to see that wonder, to see that newness. One of the things that's fun about a seven-month-old 
is everything is amazing to Katerina. Like, Terry will take her outside and they'll look at the rain together, and she could just stare for like 30 minutes at the rain coming through the rain spout. She just thinks that's the coolest thing. Or the other morning, she was starting to crawl around, and so she was banging on her bedroom door. She was out of the crib. I was with her in the living room, but she's banging on it and realizing that her, her hand can make the wood, re, wood sound reverberate. And she thought that's the coolest thing. Wonder at the smallest things that we all take for granted. Keith Green wrote a song called, Oh Lord, You're Beautiful. And he says, your face is all I see, for when your eyes are on this child, your love abounds to me. Many of us are familiar with that song, but what we may not know is backing it up a little bit is what led to Keith writing that. He says, one night I got up in the middle of the night and I wrote a letter to the Lord. He said, I didn't know where to mail it, so I put it in my Bible. And I said, Lord, you've got to do something about my heart. A lot of time has gone by since I've met you, and it's starting to harden up, which is natural. I want to have baby skin, Lord. I want to have skin like a baby on my heart. It's starting to get old and wrinkled and calloused. It's not because of anything that I'm doing. It's because of a lot of things I'm not doing. And then he says he stayed up till 2 a.m. and he wrote that song, Lord, you're beautiful. Lord, I'm amazed by you, right? Lord, I'm in awe and wonder of you. For when your eyes are on this adult child, your love abounds to me. Right? So I think we have to ask the Lord to give us fresh eyes this Advent season, to give us eyes like a baby, right? To see with newness the wonder in the world that God has made and how amazing it is that he sent Jesus. But then the shepherds teach us that wonder can't wait, right? That wonder can't, can't wait. The shepherds had divine interruptions in the middle of their ordinary evening. Now, there was no way you could argue for them to ignore a choir of angels singing and the, lights, the night sky lighting up. But they had a choice later on, whether they were going to finish out their shift or they were going to run immediately after Jesus, right? And, and so they hurry off. And, 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 and God blesses their work and blesses their, th- what they're doing and shows up right there. He doesn't wait till they come to a right spot in order to do that. God just shows up. Sometimes I think we have divine interruptions, and we're like, yeah, it can wait a little bit, right? Like, I, I am really in the middle of some other things. I, I can get like this very, like, boxed, boxy in my thinking, like, task-oriented. I have a few more things to do, and then, then I'll pay attention. And God's like, yeah, sometimes wonder can't wait. When I'm at, when I'm at work and I'm moving, run after me in the moment. Chase me there. It was 3.45 a.m. at our house the other night. Kat was up, and, I, and, and normally Terry is up with her, but he had already done more than his fair share in his shifts. So I'm there holding Kat, thinking that I'm like being Mama Grinch, because I want Kat to know this is not the time of night to be up. Right? So she'll look up at me, and I refuse to smile. No lights, no talking, no toys. And I thought that this is going to make it so that she'll realize I'm going to go back to bed. And we're sitting there in this Ikea chair, and there's fabric on the chair. And all of a sudden, she starts running her fingernails over the chair, just enjoying the sense of the fabric and how they feel against her fingers. And I am like, you have got to be kidding me, girl. Like, we are sitting there. There is nothing for you to play with. There's nothing for you to have wonder about. But to the eyes who want to see, there's wonder everywhere. There's ways of newness. There's ways of freshness that the Lord can bring. 
Thirdly, the shepherds are, in, I think, in a posture to spread that wonder because they have an encounter where they're aware of the bigness of God, right? When the angels come, there's a sense of majesty, of the glory of the Lord shining around them. They're not limited to a small God mentality. They're aware of God's transcendence. And in my own life, I think back to times that were difficult, and one of the greatest things that God started to do in those times was blow up my boxes. He started blowing up my boxes of, these are the only ways that I can work, Kate. Now, I'm not talking about heresy or bad theology, but I'm talking about the ways that in our own thinking, we start to think we've pretty got much got God figured out. I've pretty much got God managed. And then God comes along and says, you want to know more of who I am? And blows that up. So he did for the shepherds, right? He blew up their understanding of how God would show up. Why would God show up in a manger, in a feeding trough, in a space that was for overflow travelers? Danny Gokey, uh, I really appreciate him as an artist, and he has a song called More Than You Think I Am. I don't know if any of you know it, but in the lyrics, he says, as if God is talking, he says, you always think I'm somewhere on a mountaintop, but never think behind bars. You'd be amazed the places that I'd go to be with you, where you are. So forget what you heard, what you think that you know. There's more to me than ever has been told. I'm more than you dreamed. I'm more than you understand. Your days and your times were destined for our dance. I catch all your tears. I burn your name on my heart. I'm more than you think I am. I'm more than you think I am. Especially when we're in a season of COVID isolation, it's easy for things to just go on autopilot. Even how we drive home from the grocery store, the same people that we call, how we connect with others, right? And the Lord, I believe, wants to expand our understanding that he's more than we think he is, that he's up to more than we know, that he can't, if, if the Bible says, which it does, that the highest heavens can't contain you, then we can't contain him just with the smallness of our imagination. The Bible says even we see dimly, right? Even on prophetic words, we see dimly. There's more to God than we know. That God is so transcendent, he's so holy other, but he's also so imminent, he's so close. The shepherds get that. They get the transcendence in the angels appearing and singing, but they get the imminence in the closeness of God. God come near, the word become flesh, the incarnation. Brennan Manning, in his book Ruthless Trust, writes about the impact of the loss of transcendence on kids' lives. He says, when the glory of the transcendent God is not addressed, our focus shifts to human behavior, the cultivation of virtues and vices, the qualities of discipleship, and so forth. Moralizing surges to the fore in this unbalanced spirituality, meaning we reduce God to these are the rules and this is what he's asking of us. At the very outset, it presents a warped idea of the relationship between God and humans. From her parents, a child learns of a deity who strongly disapproves of disobedience, hitting one's brothers and sisters, and telling lies. When the little one goes to school, she realizes that God shares the fussy concerns of her teachers. At church, she learns that God has another set of priorities. She is told that he is displeased that the congregation is not growing numerically, that a regular attendance is the norm, and that his recurring fiscal demands are not being met. When she reaches high school, she discovers God's interests have expanded to an obsession with sex, drinking, and drugs. Through this indoctrination, God is unwittingly associated with fear in most young hearts. I read that, and I almost fell on the floor when I was pregnant, because I thought, God... How, how do you, how do you parent, how do you teach in such a way that kids learn that God isn't just, not just reinforcing, you know, 
do this and do that, right and wrong, that it's about relationship. And that sense of God's transcendence and that sense of his imminence is one of the ways that we hold that imbalance, that the shepherds were able to have that sense of wonder, but then they followed the voice of God through the angel and they ran after. They weren't even people who were following the rules. They were under rabbinic ban from what we know at that point. But God shows up. I think as we as we start to get ready to close here, I think there's also something that we see from the shepherd's story that's really important. The shepherds admit their fear along the way with their wondering. Because when we come to the topic of wonder, I don't know about you, but sometimes I think of wonder and I associate it with wandering, W-A-N-D-E-R-I-N-G. Like that God isn't big enough or strong enough or capable enough to handle all the questions that I have, the hurts that I carry, the things that keep us up at night. And I was wondering, it's like, God, what is it that keeps us from wonder? What keeps us from awe and amazement at you and what you've done? I think it's woundedness. I think it's that sense of pain, that sense of fear, that sense of, is God going to show up? Has God delivered like I thought he would? And I love that what happens is the angel specifically addresses that. It says, don't be afraid. So the shepherds are terrified when God shows up. And the angel says, I, again, I have hope for you. I have good news for you today. It's good news today. It's not just good news tomorrow on the day of Christmas. It's good news for us today that we have a Savior that's come close, that God would choose ordinary people, that he could have chosen the wise men who were more highfalutin in society to be the first people to, to, be, to have this announcement and to go see Jesus. But he chooses humble folks who are just going about their daily life, just doing their business. He addresses their real on-the-ground fear and still uses them to breed wonder and hope. And the shepherds return. We don't know for sure if they bowed their knee in formal worship, but they return glorifying and praising God. They return with a sense of wonder. So whether you're like the shepherds and your heart is full of awe and wonder this morning, and it's leading you towards greater worship, or whether maybe you're like Mary, and you're more of an internal processor, and treasuring up and holding those things in your heart. This morning, God has hope and fresh wonder that he wants to give us. And he wants to use us to share that wonder with a world that desperately needs to know that there is hope for them, and why God loved them so much to come. Amen? Will you pray with me? God, we need you to fill us afresh with wonder and awe of who you are and what you've done. God, I pray this morning in the quietness of our homes and our hearts and here in service, Lord, that you'd fill us again. God, that you'd remove any calluses that are on our hearts any blindness that's on our eyes, any familiarity that's led to complacency. God, we want to be amazed by you. We want to to worship you fully and wholly this season. And we want to be a witness, God, to those we come in contact with on a regular basis who are desperately wondering if there's any hope in this world. Thank you, Lord. We commit the rest of this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen.